Well, Tom, thank you so much for letting us take a little look around um, some of the cars. We, uh, the first thing I want to know is, like, what's the process when a car first comes in? I gather these are sort of slightly newer in stock. Um, detailing, I suppose. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've got great detailers, uh, full-time crew that, uh, you know, a car, some cars we can spend two weeks and people call it cleaning, valeting, mm -hmm. we call it detailing, but we can literally take a, an old car apart, properly detail it, clean it, mm -hmm. put it all back together. And we also spend on our older cars, you know, we'll spend at least a month researching it after we've purchased it. So we'll research it before purchase, mm. but then after we've purchased it, you know, we will spend a long time trying to collate as much information as we can, any period images, any period correspondence, reaching out to, you can't have, do all this before you buy the car, because by the Take time, too long. Yeah, yeah. you know, reaching out to every previous owner, speaking with them about the car, their, their history with the car, and, you know, trying to collate as much as we can. I mean, these are quite interesting. I mean, I make no Our apology corner. that uh, Porsches aren't my <laughs> most favourite, but this has been converted and it's now road legal. This is road legal. <laughs> this is the only example uh, in existence today that is currently road registered and road legal. Uh, so GT1 race car. This is a three-time Canadian championship winning car. This is a, uh, a Daytona 24-hour entrant. Um, it's got great race history. Uh, it's the only Evo spec tub to have ever left the factory in Evo spec from new. Less than 10 of these exist today, these customer race cars. And then you've got, you know, a handful of works cars. Um, very, mm. this is Porsche's, you know, for any Porsche collector, this is uh, top of the tree. It looks pretty special to me. Very special, beautifully restored. Um, it's clean as well. It's clean. Um, <laughs> although the boys didn't have to do much to this one, but uh, all road converted, road registered on a UK registration plate. So you could actually drive this through central London. Wow. I, I can mean, that's, see that's... you in it now, Amanda. <laughs> Don't try and sell that to me. <laughs> Um, but what else do you have here that you think is really particularly special? I mean, you know, let's have a quick walk around. So, you know, this is a Porsche 918 Spider. This has just arrived in a UK supplied car with the uh, liquid paint and the martini livery. It's nice, actually. I, do, I, I like the paint. The paint costs an absolute fortune. Um, two eight, the, this is a, a car that is one of, in my own personal collection. Um, 288 GTO. That's the oldest Ferrari supercar in existence. The, that actual chassis. So a GTO was the first Ferrari supercar. That is one of the six prototypes and that's the oldest surviving prototype. The history on that car is also phenomenal, but we can go into that. Um, I mean, this is amazing. Totally original, no paintwork. Really? Ever, ever. Really? This car was gifted to the one and only owner by Enzo Ferrari. The one and only owner was uh, a gentleman called Marco Piccinini. Marco Piccinini was the head of the Ferrari Sportive department, so the head of Ferrari for Formula One from something like 1979 until 1990. And as a bonus for his 1983 season, he got a 288 GTO and I bought it from Marco. Wow. Um, so that's phenomenal. This was Sterling Moss's Ferrari F40. Now, see, I, I, I love F40s. I'm an F40 fan. This is, you know, it's probably the most iconic of all modern supercars. It's the pin-up car. It's, it's the car that young boys and girls all dreamed of owning. Um, and and uh, yeah, this, this was Sterling Mosses. It's uh, 3,000 miles from new. Again, totally original. Uh, really, really good a question car. just on, mm. on, on mileages. Because mm. mileages can severely affect values over time. So if someone wants to buy a car with low miles, like 3,000 miles, would they just keep it and not use it? Or? Well, I think this, this, this is car, a shame, isn't it? I think the exact mileage on this car is something like 3,800 miles. So if somebody ever offered you yeah. Sterling Moss's F40 yeah. and they said, you can buy Sterling's F40, that is a UK car, it's two or three owners from new, it's yeah. done 3,800 miles. Yeah. Or if somebody said to you, it's done 6,000 miles, would that change your decision in buying it? No, it wouldn't, because it's Stirling Moss's car. Yeah. Exactly. But if it so wasn't Stirling Moss, but if it wasn't his car, 
Would it still change your decision? No, if, if it was, if you could buy a really a, original F40 yeah. and it done 3,800 miles or 6,000 miles, does it really make a difference? Well, it's it's not about 3,000 no, to 20,000. That makes a difference. Yeah. Also, probably the 20,000 mile car won't be as original. Uh, it does make a difference on value. I would say it would make a difference of something like um, three or four hundred thousand pounds. Mm. <gasps> Cost yeah, per mile. That's, well, that's a the, lot of... the reason I was asking. It, I've come across um, clients who have bought low, as low mile uh, examples as they can find, and then they buy a high high mile one to actually just use and don't really use them. Yeah, we we have clients who do that, but you know, I I get the pleasure of that. That's really. a first world problem, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> I it's love problem I, have. <laughs> I love using my cars. I love yeah. using them, but I also get great pleasure out of just owning them. So I would never sell this car, uh, this F40, mm. and I never really am never that bothered about driving it. I'd much rather drive the yeah. 288 yeah. GTO. Yeah. I just oh, like the yours? idea of owning. Yeah, that one is. Yeah, oh. I just love the idea of owning it. Um, but That's then, you, you know, we sw <laughs> before we go into Mulsheim's. Um, favourites of this is, that's the last Veyron Super Sport that was ever produced um, that's a great Bugatti Chiron we'll get to you know when you look at some of this area of car which these are cars that I am really fond of this no one knows about this car yet we've recently sold it we sold it without doing any marketing so you're the only people we've ever shared info with um, this is known as the Cafe Racer People are going to find out about it. Well, they are now, but now we've sold it, they can find out. But um, this is a, a Series 1 Pininfarina Cabriolet. So a Series 1 Cabriolet was a much more exclusive car than a California Spider. Great intricate design details all around the car. And then the first owner of this car was a very well-known Belgium racing driver who wanted his PF Cabriolet spiced up. So it had many... Um, many unique features it had the headrest the metal ton metal tonner cover yeah. the bumperettes the covered headlamps the competition fuel filler uh, no door handles it had the wraparound perspect windscreen which very few ferraris have ever been produced like that so that's the exact spec it left the factory in back in 1956. and where is that, is that staying in the uk staying or? in the uk going to a fantastic home and uh, it was a re that was a real stimulating car to be involved gorgeous. with. Um, I like, I'm, I'm particularly, I mean, I have to say, in terms of just pure aesthetics, I would always focus my attention this way rather than that way. Yeah, I would actually focus my attention this way, whether it's for aesthetics or for anything. I love this area yeah. of car because that, that's a competition 275. So they all look very similar, but to give you an idea, that's like a seven and a half million pounds car. And then, you know, these cars are late twos. Um, Mere twos. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, super, yeah. all very collectible. There's only six GTB4s ever produced in that colour. Uh, Verde Pinot. Um, you know, as I say, that's a 9000 series competition car. This is a, a right-hand drive 4Cam, of which UK cars, there were only 27. And, you know, any serious collector in the UK has a right hand drive four cam. Um, so that's a car that we've actually got a tour, our tour this year, I don't know if you've heard about it or not, but we're doing a 275 tour in Tuscany in early yep. June. Um, so this is the car that I'll be driving on the event. Do you need a map reader? My wife has already uh, actually, she's, yeah, she's bagsied that one. Fair enough, so. okay. <laughs> well, let's uh, have a little- McLaren, McLaren P1. Uh, this is a UK car, one owner from new, 5,000 miles. Uh, these cars actually, I think, have aged very well. Oh, and it's still fresh. Yeah. Fresh as today. Maybe. Yeah, I think the design think, of them, though, there's yeah, some beautiful. cars that, uh, you know, don't age particularly well. I think the design of a P1, I think as the years have gone by, it's become aesthetically it's, more pleasing. And actually, when you see it here, amongst everything else, you also realise just how small it is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, when you so, see some what, of the modern cars are even uh, Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at and these guys. They're starting to rise again. On them. They're starting to rise, but LaFerraris have shot up probably the best part 20%. Porsche 918s, 20%. Yeah. P1s are due to, I think, go. Um, Bugatti Chiron, look at the quality of the finish of this car, though. Look at the, the carbon fibre, the exposed carbon. Like Bugatti, uh, you know, say what you want about them, their, their build quality is far superior to any other manufacturer. Yes, yeah. Um, and then 
What, well, we have uh, 599 GTO. A right-hand drive car. Oh, that, yeah, there's not many, right? Drive. No, and they've only done a couple of thousand miles from new. That little 250F? Yes, how, <laughs> how cool is that? <laughs> Can we get in? <laughs> you'll probably I think struggle. I might be a bit big. You'll struggle to get in that one. So um, these sca these scale cars, I absolutely love. But I, I I like the ones that you know you can get different quality of. It's got a flat tire. Yeah, I know. So you just it's only just arrived. Oh, there. has it? Okay, yeah. fair enough. It hasn't been, hasn't been gone process. through the detail yet. No, it's got to go through the whole process. This has just arrived. A two, an, another two eight eight GTO, nine thousand kilometres from new. Isn't this Magnum car? That's a 308. Oh, Jesus Christ, yeah. you've just gone from hero to no, zero in one I was, second. I was just trying to remember what it was. <laughs> cut, cut, cut. I remember cut. what it was. LaFerrari. Um, it's nice to see a LaFerrari that's not in retail red. red. Yeah. You know, a black car, that was a, a UK supplied one. Um, there isn't any marks on it, is there? Let's have a look. Ah, that's that, yeah, but that's in the, the construction of the body. Oh, okay. That's the difference between Ferrari and Bugatti. Bugatti, you would you'd... never get that. No. no, okay, sorry. Um, and then we do have the odd modern car that will because you know, client relationships with clients. Our business is not really specializing in those type of cars, but we do always. I can't help it, I'm just a trader. So if a guy offers me a Range Rover or a Bentley or a modern Ferrari, yeah, I'll buy it, but um. You know, it's not really where we sit in the market. Right-hand drive, 997 GT2 RS. These are doing well. Yeah, um, very rare car. Mm, they are doing well. <laughs> They're very popular at the moment. With I us. could see you in that car, Darren. Do you? I could, yeah. I think, okay. I, don't, I, I don't think Amanda's the Porsche girl, but I think you are definitely the Porsche man. I, I quite like them, it's fine. I yeah. just have to point out the crew here are loving it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We're doing a lot of these and they're great cars. 355s, you've just skipped past 355s yeah. now. 355s and 993s, they're like a real sweet spot for me because that's my nostalgia. When I was growing up, you know, my dad's, yeah. you know, was selling more of these cars than anyone else. And, um, you know, I remember s sitting in them and watching the gears being changed and you know moving the cars myself when they were new like I remember 993 turbos the very first one we ever had in 95 um, and it was like the first car delivered in the UK and I remember sitting and smelling it and the same smell is still in that car <laughs> today you know Porsches of that era actually did have a smell I'm gonna go and have a sniff <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'll get you interested in Porsches oh Oh, okay, I know the yeah. smell. Yeah, I get the smell. And these cars to me are so undervalued. Like a manual 355, you know, I don't want, I don't want to sell any of these cars for the time being, um, but a manual 355 Spider, that one's done about 5,000 miles. And say if it's, I don't know, a bit over 100,000 pounds, and you compare, we sell Dinos like hotcakes for 400,000 mm. pounds. And if you wind the clock forward, say 15, 20 years time, that's, I wonder, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, where that price point, gap actually. is going to be. Ten years ago, Dino's were at 300, 325. They haven't really moved on so much. Yeah, yeah. I would say ten years ago, uh, I don't know. Ten, they probably doubled. I reckon. You think? Yeah, so I'd so. say they probably doubled in ten years. I can't quite get over that colour. Do you like it or not? No, I don't like yeah. it. <laughs> That's because it's a Porsche. No, I don't like the colour as well. Do you know what? Colours make cars. But, I, yeah. I and really have no desire for just boring colours. And Sorry, is that yours? Yep, and it's the number plate. I um, thought you sold your cars. <laughs> some of them. We've actually, we've got a load of cars next door as well that we haven't showed you, but um, that car, when it was new, that colour would probably have been the kiss of death. Yeah. I think it is still. It's not the kiss of death now. So many people send emails going, oh, I saw you, this Ocean Jade 993 Turbo S, will you sell it? Like, colours make cars. I sell it. No, 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 Get no. no. That's the only, that's the only, <laughs> It's the only one. And but then, look at this. Here we go. We're talk, now, now we're, we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah. Grand Prix cars. So Grand Prix cars. I love Formula One cars. Yeah. I, I feel so comfortable buying them because I think they are way undervalued. If you think that a great Grand Prix car is about the same price as a Ferrari 275, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense when how many people went into constructing this car and what is actually done. The one thing that I stay disciplined with is that I only like to buy Grand Prix winning cars. So if it came on the podium, second and third, five times, 
not interested. I really want a winner. Yeah. That is a Jackie Stewart winning car. And to be able to, uh, there isn't many Jackie Stewart winning chassis because he'd done so much of his winning in the same cars. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one car out there that I think he won eight races in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really proud to actually uh, have bought that car and own it. This, this is a super famous um, car. So this is the FW15C. This was pro rata, probably the most advanced car ever in Formula One. And Damon Hill drove it as his first season with Williams in 93. And he won three Grand Prix in it. He came second three times, fourth three or four times. Um, he came second at Donington to Ayrton Senna in the rain, mm -hmm. the famous Ayrton Senna race. Came second oh, God, to Ayrton yeah. Senna at Monaco. This is, as a chassis history goes, it's incredible. Um, that's the car that you're going to drive, Amanda. Yes. So this, um, okay. <laughs> this is the FW17. I did uh, drive this car around um, Jerez, actually, for might a couple of days. Might need some new tyres. What's wrong with the tyres? I think might we need some more sticky tyres. Well, the, the, they're okay. Okay. But for you, we'll probably, because you haven't been in a Formula One car, we'll probably put full wets on. Oh. <laughs> ha, ha. So we'll, we'll put full wets just to make sure you're okay. Um, phenomenal to drive, though. It's, it's amazing how the, the cockpit the cockpit surround changed so much in just a few short yeah. years. Yeah. Well, obviously Ayrton died in '94, yeah. and then they had to make them they had to put more protection in for the drivers. So this is a '95 car, but I actually struggled to fit in that car in the '93. Really? Really struggle. I'd struggle as well. <laughs> Darren, I reckon we we'll get you in there. Do you think so with the crane? <laughs> <laughs> um, of all the Grand Prix cars, this is the daddy the absolute daddy this is a six-time grand prix winner won the 1975 world championship won the first two races in 1976 won monaco and always driven by nicky lauda and then after it was um after it, it, it they changed the regulations the fia from the tall airbox so yep. then the car had to be parked up and after it was parked up Ferrari's most important client, um, Pierre Bardenon, wanted to buy it from Enzo Ferrari. Enzo sold it to him because he considered Pierre Bardenon's collection as his museum. And then Pierre Bardenon sold it to another great French collector called Jacques Seton. Jacques Seton then put it in a bonded warehouse in a crate for 40 years. What? 40 years. And I bought it off of Jack. And when I went to see it, it had an inch thick of dust on it. And then a carpet laid over the top of the um, crate. It the is, I mean, it is beautifully mm. original, isn't it? Totally original. I mean, you know, DNA swab in there and you'll, yeah. it's all Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda was the only person to ever drive this car. God, it's mad when you see it now. When you, when you see it now. Petrol tanks. Yeah, I know. I mean, you're sat on three bombs. But also bombs. just how basic it is, how sort of raw, unfinished. Yeah. Uh, even when you just compare it, not that much later, how they, how they developed, how they were finished. Mm. I mean, even just the headrest. The development in Formula One, though, the technology moves on year by year on such a fast rate yeah. of knots. You know, it, it, it obviously tr it trickles down into car production. But if you think this car's from 1975 and then 1993, even though it isn't that many years later, it's the evolution... Chalk and cheese, you know, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Aston Martin. So these are really special Aston Martins. This is a, a works car, DB3S. Um, this is a car that was raced by Roy Salvadori, was sold by Aston, was raced by Peter Collins and then sold by Aston Martin to Peter Collins. And then this is the car that probably put Peter Collins on the map. But because of his um, successes with this car, he then went on to uh, drive for Ferrari. Uh, really, really special car. Of, of all the 10 works DB3Ss, I would definitely rank this car in the top three. So very special. And then this is Aston Martin's own, Mr. David Brown, his own DB3S coupe. So they, wow. on, they only ever built three coupe versions. They were all road cars, um, not works cars. And they went to, you know, three special people. One was David Brown, one was Max Aitken, and I think the other one was Ropner, maybe. And um, 
this was his own car from 56 into 58 and it then got sold to a really famous successful lady privateer called Jean Bloxham and Jean Bloxham you know fantastic driver used to beat the men up all the time <laughs> not physically but on the racetrack sounds like my kind of girl yeah great uh, and she was quite local to here and it, her and her husband at the same time coincidentally owned both these cars oh. and they raced against each other and they've come back together now yeah They've been reunited 60 years later. How fortuitous. Well, listen, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time and showing us around. It's been enlightening. Pleasure. You. Hope you've enjoyed. You're, you're more than welcome to come whenever. And uh, yeah, well, I'm looking forward to, to you uh, pulling a pint for us.